Let's create Tic-Tac-Toe, a simple text-based game which you can easily code along with me in Python. Let's get started. We start by creating a file called tic-tac-toe.py in which we are going to write our Python code. Then we create three different constants. One for each of the symbols that we want to show in our tic-tac-toe board. An empty tile, which will be the square, an X tile and an O tile. Then we create the board variable, which will store all the tiles on our tic-tac-toe board. We can create the board by hard coding all the values in there. But since we made our tile constants, we can use the tile constants. And we can even go a step further. And instead of writing out the entire board bit by bit, we can use a list comprehension in order to create our 2D list storing the symbols for the starting tiles, which is all empty tiles. Let's now print our empty tic-tac-toe board in the terminal. As you can see, it is not structured the way we would like it in a square, but it's all on one line. So let's create a for loop to iterate over each row in the board and print each row separately. As you can see, it looks more like a board now, and we can go one step further to make it look identical by using space and then joining all the items in each row and then printing them. As you can see, it now looks like the tic-tac-toe board we drew before, full of empty tiles. We now copy and paste this nifty bit of code into a function called draw board, so we can reuse it later in order to draw the board in between moves. Instead of the print, we can now use it like this, and it still works the same. We are now ready to create our game loop. And in order to loop, we need some sort of condition telling us when to keep looping. In our case, we're going to create a function called isGameOver, which receives the board and it checks whether someone has won, whether there is a tie, or whether the game should still continue. And based on this function, we can keep looping and asking the user to make a move for either X or O. For now, we'll simply define the function as pass, so we can use it now and define it later. Let's create our game loop using while. We can say, while our game is not over, do the following. Ask for the user's input, validate the user's input, place the user's input on the board, meaning we place either an X or an O on the board, and then switch the players. Before our while loop, we then create a variable called current player, which keeps track of the symbol of the player whose turn it currently is. We can either set the current player to start as a specific tile, like the X tile, or we can import the random library and pick the starting player based on a randomly generated value. After this, we clean up some of our comments and we're ready to get our user input. Our user needs to give input for the row and the column where he or she wants to place the X or the O. Then we realize it might be handy to be able to see the board before giving your input of which row and column you want to place your symbol. So we call draw board right before asking for the input. And we add a print statement showing which player's turn it currently is. Or in other words, which symbol is going to be placed. Now it is time to validate the user input. The user can basically enter any key on the keyboard. So it is important that one of the things that we check is that the row they enter is between 1 and 3. And the same goes for the column, since our tic-tac-toe board is a 3 by 3 board. The way we do this is by checking whether the row and the column is outside the expected range. If so, we print that the user should enter a value between 1 and 3 for the row and the column, and then we use continue to jump back to the top of the while loop. This draws the board again and asks the user again for new row and column inputs. Next, we need to do another validation step. Namely, we need to check whether the row and column that have been chosen by the user is an empty tile. And we're going to do it the same way as we did with checking whether the row and the column are within our given range. We're going to say if the tile is not empty, we print something to the user to inform them and we continue back to the top of the while loop. Now that the user input is validated to be within the board as well as to be on an empty tile, we can place the tile by saying board at the row and the column is equal to the current player because the current player represents the symbol that needs to be placed for the player whose turn it currently is. Then we can switch the players by saying that the current player is equal to the O tile player if the current player is currently the X tile player. Else, we make it the X tile player. Now our while loop is done and after switching players, we jump back to the top of the while loop and the condition in the while loop checks whether the game is over yet. Before we make that function, let's have it return false and try out our while loop. 
We run our program. We see our nice tic-tac-toe board and we see that X can make a move. We enter row zero and then column zero and then we get an error, namely a type error, smaller than not supported between instances of string and int. If we look at the error, it is caused on line 40. But the reason for the error comes from the input method, which we use to fetch our row and column from our users. By default, the input method returns a string. So in order to fix it, we need to make sure we get an integer. Uh, we also want our users to give values between one and three. So when we ask for our row and for our column, we make sure to put one three in our question. Then to make sure that the strings we get from the user become an integer, we wrap them in an int. So we write int and write parentheses around our input. This way, whatever is returned by the input goes from a string to an integer. Then we have to realize that in programming languages, lists and arrays count from zero, whereas we want our user to answer from one to three. So everywhere where we refer to row and column in the same context as our board, we need to subtract one from the row and the column, because if the user enters row one, we mean the board at row zero. Now that we cast our user inputs to integers, we have to deal with another problem, which we see if we run our program and enter the letter A as our row or our column. We get a value error, invalid literal for int, saying that it received the character A. This is because when we cast our string to an int, the casting expects a string in the format of an actual number, like 120. Or 10. If we pass the letter a to the integer casting function, we get this value error. In order to fix it, we are going to wrap asking the user for the row and column in a try except block. The code that could cause the error will be wrapped in a try, and then we write an except value error block, which when triggered uses continue to jump back to the top of the while loop and prints a line to the user that tells him he needs to use a number between one and three for the row or in the column. The way this works is when something within the try triggers some sort of error, in our case, we expect a value error, we go into the accept block. So we can test it again by running our game, entering a letter, and then we can see that our error is handled and we simply see that the user must now enter a number instead of our program actually crashing. We then continue to fill in values between one and three for the rows and columns to make sure that the X's and O's get placed correctly, and they do. We then reach a state in which the game should have recognized that a player has won because the first column contains only O's. But before we make sure that our program knows whether someone has won or there is a tie, we also test our second validation step to make sure that we cannot place an X or an O on a position where there is already an X or an O. And as you can see, it correctly prints the message that this row and column is already taken and the user should try again. Now that we have finalized the body of our while, we can start to fix the condition and create the function isGameOver. isGameOver decides whether the game has finished based on the fact that one of the players has won or it's a tie. In any other case, the game is not over. Let's quickly write down all our options for when the game is over. We first note down the tie and then above that, we need to check the rows for if someone has won. Then we check all the columns for if someone has won. And then we check the left up to right bottom diagonal for if someone has won. And then we check the left bottom to right up diagonal for if someone has won. Now that we know the steps to follow for our function, we can start filling them in. Notice that we have to check for both players if they have won using rows, columns or diagonals. So we create a list called players, which contains the types of players there are the X-tile players and the O-tile players. Let's start by detecting whether either of these players has won using rows. We say for each symbol in players, go over each row of the board, and using if row.count equals three, we can check whether that row contains three symbols of the current player we are checking. We return true so that we exit the for loop and the entire function, because we don't need to check any other winning conditions anymore. Next, we can start to check the columns. We again use a for loop for each symbol in the list of players. And then instead of iterating over each row in the board, we create a nested for loop for i in range three. And then inside that for j in range three. For every index i, j will iterate three times. So if we use i to mark the column, 
and J to mark the row in which we look for a symbol, we can iterate over each row in a single column. If we then create a variable called symbol count, and we say if the board at J i is equal to that symbol, we can then increment the symbol count, and if after looping over an entire column that symbol count is equal to 3, then we can return true because we found three of the same symbols that are not empty in that column. And just like before, once we find a winning condition, we return true because we don't care about any of the other conditions that might possibly exist, because they won't exist. For the diagonals, we use a similar method using symbol count, where we count each symbol individually. Each diagonal only contains three tiles, so we only need a single for loop. If we keep checking the board at row i and column i, we will check the up left to down right diagonal. This will go over board at row 0, column 0, row 1, column 1, and row 2, column 2, aka the left up to down right diagonal. For the down left to up right diagonal, we do a similar thing, but we reverse the row. We want the row to go from down left we want the row to start at 2, so we say 2 minus i, which will start at 2 minus 0, which is row 2. We want the columns to go from left to right in our down left to up right diagonal, so for the column we can simply use i. We then check the symbol and increment the counter if necessary. We then forget to write if symbol count equals 3 return true, but we will add it later. To check for the tie, we actually check the opposite. So. We check for each row in the board. If it contains an empty tile, that means that we don't have a tie and we know for sure, so we can return false. If we end up finishing this for loop, that means we didn't find an empty tile in the entire board, so we can return true because the game is over. Since no more empty tiles means everyone has placed the board entirely full, and since we reached this part of the code in the isGameOver function, none of the other winning conditions have triggered, and thus it is a tie. Finally, we need to extract the information about who has actually won. And inside the function is game over, we have that knowledge. Because each time we check whether someone has won through a row, column or diagonal, we check that for both the players. And that information is stored in the variable symbol. Each time we do for symbol in players. So when none of the players have won and we have a tie, we can return none since none of the players have actually won. So totally at the bottom, where we return true, we also return none, because it's a tie. And then everywhere else where we return true, we also return the symbol. Because at the moment where we satisfy the condition of finding enough symbols, we are checking it for that symbol. When the game is not over and we return false, we also return none, because the player information is not important when the game is not over. This time we also add our if symbol count equals 3 return true and the symbol, which we forgot when we created our down left to up right diagonal check. Now that we return two things, true and the player who has won, we need to go to our while loop condition and make sure that whatever the function is game over returns, we take index 0 of that, which is the boolean that describes whether the game is over or not. After our while loop, when we know our game is done, we use our isGameOver function one more time to extract the winner, and then we check if the winner is none, we can print the game is over and it's a tie, else we print the winner, which is the symbol of the winner, and has won. Let's run the code and check if our tic-tac-toe game works. As you can see, the game correctly identifies that we have a winner. But because we draw the board at the start of our while loop, and we now made a game ending move so we didn't get back to the start of our while loop, we have to add an extra print statement for the board. Let's play through our game one final time to see a winning game with the final winning move. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new in this video. If you did, please leave a like. And if you want to see more content like this, consider subscribing. Have a nice day.